Hello and a very warm welcome to moneycontrol.com. There are two narratives emerging from India. One is that India's forex reserves are at 566 billion dollars. The world is bracing for a recession and at a time when economies are cutting back on spending, India's capital expenditure to GDP ratio is at an 18 year high. Its revenue deficit to fiscal deficit is at a 17 year low. India's macros are looking very, very solid. India is currently amongst the fastest growing economies in the world. It has just placed a historic order for 470 new aircrafts that the US President, Mr. Biden said, will support over a million jobs for Americans and reflects the strength of US-India economic partnership. Clearly, India has come a long way. But there is an alternative narrative that is also emerging that is questioning India's institutions. Billionaire investor George Soros said that he expects a democratic revival in India. A report has raised red flags on one of India's largest conglomerates. To understand the genesis of these two narratives, we have with us Professor Salvatore Barbones, Associate Professor, University of Sydney, and he's also currently researching a book on Indian democracy. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Babuans. I've been uh, watching your videos. It seems like you're having a great time in India. You, uh, in, in this uh, world of uh, constant naysayers on the India story, your voice has emerged as one of the most rational voices to defend the India story. I want to ask you, begin by asking you, the, the, the two narratives that we see emerging, where India is glorified as one of the fastest growing economies in the world at the World Economic Forum, at the same forum, you have investors like George Soros, who, who put down India. We had Mr. Soros say that, in, that he is naive enough to expect a democratic revival in India. What do you make of, of uh, these, these voices that are coming in from the West right now? Is the West resentful of India's rise. When investors look at the economy and the potential for growth in India, of course, they're very driven by the numbers. They're driven by rational analysis of quantitative data. But when people start talking about democracy and about uh, individual liberty and human rights in India, they revert instead to a much more qualitative, much more opinion based approach. So instead of having this uh, objective narrative that we have on the economy, we have a very subjective narrative mm -hmm. when it comes to democracy and human rights. And that's really the issue here. People are allowing their, 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 they're, they're going to the facts when it comes to the economy. They're going to their feelings when it comes to democracy. And that's why we see these you know, very negative impressions of Indian democracy in the West because they're all driven by the feelings of people, Indians primarily, who have a platform in the West, who are well known in the West. Um, the Western world's not anti-India, but the half dozen or so Indians who regularly write for major US and UK publications are thoroughly opposed to the current government of India. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with opposing the government, sure. but they've taken that opposition not only to mean that they disagree with the government, but they've taken it to another level to say that the problem isn't the government, the problem is democracy itself. Mm. Uh, and that's where they're letting their own feelings run away with them instead of focusing on the facts of Indian democracy. Mm. But someone like a George Soros, you know, who, uh, who has been an ace investor, he's made his big bucks betting sure. on countries, short selling countries, he's mm -hmm. brought down economies of countries. When somebody like him uh, makes a statement about India and then you have uh, a Hindenburg research that puts out this detailed report on, uh, on an Indian company, on an Indian business group. Should that worry us, uh, Professor Baboon? Is, is Mr. Soros' statement indicative of something that we should be mindful of or cognizant of? People like Soros and Hindenburg 
are financial experts, and I'm certainly not going to try to guess the market better than them. Both of them see companies, or in Soros's case, currencies that are overvalued. I think a lot of people probably agreed that Adani was overvalued, uh, you know, mm -hmm. had a massive share price run up in the past year, and they try to talk them down and to make money by short selling them. And mm -hmm. as financial experts, I wouldn't quarrel with them. They, they probably are right. Uh, but <laughs> they don't take the same kind of hard-nosed analytical approach when it comes to understanding society. They're not experts on society. They're not experts on democracy. Uh, so what they're doing is alleging things about democracy, in Soros's case very directly, in Hindenburg's case indirectly talking about what they view as poor governance in India. Right. When they really haven't studied governance in India, it's something they can say and get away with because mm -hmm. if they make claims about the financials on Adani, mm -hmm. of course independent financial analysts are going to check those statements and they're going sure. to be pushed back. If they make allegations about the institutions in India, who knows? How do we know whether an institution is well governed or not? We don't have any real hard data on that. Mm -hmm. And so the allegations go unchecked. Mm -hmm. So do you see a fallout of these allegations uh, on India right now? Do you think that India at the moment is fighting back a coloni colonization of a different kind? Is, 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 it a, is it an information war that India finds itself fighting at the moment? It, it can't be called colonization because people like Soros and Hindenburg are simply picking up on a narrative that originates in India. And I can't stress that often enough, that the Western anti-India narrative originates in India. The only way we know about democracy and institutions in India, we in the West know about it, is the complaints and the analysis we hear coming out of India. If you look at the main writers on India in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, they're all of South Asian origin, either Indian or you know, broadly sure. South Asian origin. They're all people who have strong opinions mm -hmm. about Indian democracy and Indian, Indian institutions. The problem is that they, let, they, they present their opinions as objective analysis. Now, it's very difficult mm. not to do that. Right? We all think that our opinions are the right opinions. But the proper thing to do is to acknowledge when you're writing that, well, you may have an opinion, but it's an opinion. It's not a fact. Absolutely. Instead, these criticisms of Indian democracy, of Indian institutions, are presented as facts about India. And I mean extreme allegations, allegations that India is no longer a democracy, that India has become a fascist country, that there's likely to be a genocide in India in the mm -hmm. 2020s. Uh, these kind of allegations come primarily from Indian or Indian origin mm -hmm. intellectuals and writers who have access to the Western media. These are elite Indian writers who have access to major newspapers in the U.S. or academic institutions in the U.S. who are members of the American Political Science Association or the American Sociological Association or the American Historical Association who use these international platforms not only to promote their personal politics but to promote, uh, to promote a point of view that is very colored by their personal politics. Sure. That is, instead of saying, I personally oppose the Modi government, perfectly mm -hmm. legitimate, every government needs an opposition, they're saying India must not be a democracy anymore since what kind of democracy would vote for the Modi right, government? Right, right, right. Yes, well, they're raising questions on India as a democratic country. Right. But for instance, somebody like a George Soros, he's invested billions of dollars, right. billions of dollars in propagating what he thinks is the right idea of a go governing a country. Right. And he's, he's, he's got these societies and institutions across the world and he's been funding them right. to ensure that uh, that his form of governance is what gets implemented or there is a counter narrative that emerges. Considering we are a year away from elections, do you see such voices gaining more traction right now? And do you, do you and, 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 and go back to my earlier question on should India be worried and how should India be dealing with this? We saw a lot of cabinet ministers counter Mr. Soros. Is there anything else that we can do on this? First, remember that George Soros doesn't have any particular knowledge of India. Where does he get his impression of India? <clears throat> he gets it from the very intellectuals sure. we're talking about. Right. Um, second, Soros is funding an internationalist agenda all, all over the world, a liberal internationalist agenda. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. I myself am, am a liberal internationalist. 
But I'm a liberal internationalist who recognizes that nationalism is an entirely acceptable and appropriate approach <laughs> to mm -hmm. governance. I may not be an Indian nationalist, but I have no disrespect for Indian nationalists. Uh, sure. there, there's nothing really wrong mm -hmm. with being a nationalist. So he's predisposed to listen mm -hmm. to these voices. Mm -hmm. Now, will it have an effect on India? At this point, I think very little, in that being funded by George Soros and the Open Society Foundation in a deeply nationalist, traditionalist country like India, at this point, is almost a, a, a kiss of death. <laughs> that, I think, I, mm -hmm. that is to say, I think it probably is to the current government's advantage in India mm -hmm. to highlight the hatred of George Soros for their, for their government. Mm -hmm. uh, so bizarrely, by coming out so publicly mm -hmm. against the current government of India, mm -hmm. uh, I in a way, I think George Soros is simply providing ammunition to mm -hmm. the very people he opposes. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, you know, I want to, you, you've studied the Indian democracy, and as we were discussing, you've, uh, you've studied the Indian economy. In 2017, in your book, you, you wrote that India, in, in a chapter that you wrote yeah. in a book, you wrote about India being one of the most promising countries. Right. Uh, what, what, what was encouraging you about India then, and how are you viewing India at the moment? So this is my 2017 book, Bricks or Bust, Escaping the Middle Income Trap, co-authored mm -hmm. with Hartmut Elsenhans, a German economist. Uh, we looked at the five BRICS economies, and it was clear that the other four BRICS economies had stabilized at middle income levels of development. That mm -hmm. is, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, China, and, and to a lesser extent, South Africa, have really been stagnant. Mm -hmm. uh, and you may think it's odd to say that China has been stagnant. In my own view, and in the view of economists who use what are called instrumental variable models, these are indirect models to study the Chinese economy, to get around the official narrative coming from China, to look at the economy through indirect me uh, quantitative measures, most of us agree that China really stopped growing around 2017. Mm -hmm. right? it, it's been a flat economy since then. They've sure. been reporting growth, but it hasn't really been growing. Fair. Of the five BRICS economies, only India has a dynamic economy that is likely to grow. Now, whether it will grow beyond middle income status, I can't tell you. We, mm -hmm. we have you know, 30 years to get up to there to, to what would currently be you know, 10 or, tw or $12,000 per capita GDP. Mm -hmm. But India has all the ingredients to grow to that level. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the best way to understand it is for growth in middle income countries, especially countries that have experienced periods of socialism, is that the growth occurs not because the government takes good policies, but because the government takes away the bad policies of the past. Okay. okay so India was relatively poor because of its plan, well, first of all, because of colonialism, but then mm -hmm. after colonialism, because of Nehruvian socialism, because mm -hmm. of the planned economy. The planned economy was planned very inefficiently. When you take away that layer of planning, mm -hmm. India will rapidly bounce back to a okay. level of development that's consistent mm -hmm. with its high levels of education, its strong institutions. Mm -hmm. That is, India has all the attributes of a middle-income country mm -hmm. except the income. Yes. You might say that India is a middle income society mm -hmm. that's stuck with a poor mm. country economy. Sure. Okay. Take away the, you know, take the lid off the mm -hmm. economy, it'll grow rapidly. That's exactly what happened in China. Uh, I mean, in China, when liberalization started in 1981, mm. the Chinese Communist Party didn't do anything magical. It didn't do anything uh, really intelligent. All it did was step back. Mm. <laughs> All it did was stop planning in certain sectors. And the sectors where the state withdrew mm. grew very rapidly. The sectors in China where the state remained, hmm. heavy industry, you know, steel production, those areas have not been successful. They've had very low profit margins. They've contributed relatively little to the Chinese economy. Hmm. So has the lid been taken off in there? More slowly than in China. You know, so it's okay. happened. Okay. But because India is a democracy, because there's consensus, a requirement for consensus mm -hmm. in India, those, that change has happened more slowly in India than it has in China, which was able to very rapidly Sure. Reform but its we economy. have liberalized a lot of sectors. When you say taking the lid off, what exactly? Can you can you give me some specifics on what more do we need to do? Sure. The the, the big more we need to do in mm -hmm. India is agricultural reform. Mm -hmm. uh, you, the agriculture sector is very large in India, mm -hmm. and it's very low productivity. Now I know there are some areas in Indian farming where there are very high productivity farms, but mm -hmm. India has a very large agricultural sector operating at very low productivity transforming agriculture into modern, efficient agriculture mm -hmm. is really the number one priority for India for long-term 
mm -hmm. growth. Now, that means social change. That means that farmers will inevitably mm -hmm. sell their farms to agribusiness companies and mm -hmm. will re relocate off the land mm -hmm. into the city. Many people are very afraid of that kind of social change. They say, mm -hmm. well, how will these people find jobs in the city? Or they say, no, the, the, the land is a social insurance policy for the farmer. And while that may be true, in an economy growing at 7 or 8% per year, people can find jobs in the cities. There's, there's always demand for labor that will accommodate people moving off the land mm -hmm. in India. It's always happened everywhere else. Right. We've never had a country anywhere in the world mm -hmm. that has moved to more efficient agriculture leading to people being unemployed. Sure. <laughs> you know, we, yeah. the, we just have to trust that the market will find places mm -hmm. for people who move off the land. So we did have a whole host on, I'm sure you, you tracked that story, yeah. Farm law reforms that were uh, that were the three farm laws yeah. were in, in in my analysis, and I wrote an article about them, an, mm -hmm. an, ex a, an extensive article for Foreign Policy magazine, mm -hmm. uh, saying that these laws were were for the most part positive reforms. Of course, mm -hmm. they were withdrawn in the face of social opposition, yes. and that's why I think the bounce back in mm -hmm. growth in India, this take the lid off and grow quickly right, in India, right. has been slower than in China because unlike in China. There's social resistance. Also, India is a democracy. To reform in yeah. India in a democratic yeah. country. Yeah. And that social resistance leads mm -hmm. to a slowing of the reform process. Mm -hmm. But the current government hasn't been entirely in the right here. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give another example. Just after the farm laws, mm -hmm. there was a, uh, a, a spike in the price of potatoes. Mm -hmm. And the government prohibited the export of potatoes in order to keep prices low. Sure. Well, again, what Indian farming needs is higher prices <laughs> for its produce. So mm -hmm. the proper approach to that would have been to tell urban consumers, we're very sorry potatoes are expensive, but farmers need the money more than you do. So ah. liberalization <laughs> cuts all ways, uh, right? Okay. It, it, it's mm -hmm. not just about lower prices for urban consumers. Mm -hmm. It's about higher prices, higher incomes for farmers and getting farmers off the land, mm -hmm. not forcing them off the land, mm -hmm. but enticing them off the land by making farms more valuable. Right. So, so applying the principles of a free market economy in, um, in comp you're, you're saying, because the government says that they're trying to uh, they're trying to protect the farmers. They're trying to protect. They're trying to protect people of India mm -hmm. from inflation. They have heightened, increased sure. import duties on a whole host of products as well, which are being used to manufacture finished products in India sure. to encourage manufacturing in India. So it's so they're saying that you know we're going to make imports expensive so that you're able to manufacture what you need in India to enable manufacturing of those products in India for which India was highly dependent right. on exports. Do you think this kind of uh, this kind of a policy, which which is par partially protectionist, uh, does it work in a globalized world, or uh, uh, or you think that India needs to step back a little bit and let free market forces just uh, all, all, all the research on import substitution uh, economics, which is what you're talking about, mm -hmm. is that it is not uh, it can't be shown to be destructive but it is not productive, <laughs> which is to say okay. it, it may protect individual manufacturers, but it doesn't really promote the mm -hmm. economy. What India really needs is the most efficient possible economy. Now, people are largely unaware that in places like Taiwan and South Korea, mm -hmm. that transition to growth, the first half from being a poor country to being a middle income country was entirely driven by agricultural reform. It was only then after those countries passed what would today be about $10,000 per capita GDP mm. that they began to industrialize. Okay. But the initial phase of growth was all through agricultural reform. Mm. In, in India, there's nothing wrong with make in India. You know, sure. Certainly government procurement should focus on India. I mean, these are, these are probably good things to do. Right. But at the macro level, they're not that important. The most mm -hmm. important thing to do, the Reserve Bank is already doing. Mm. That is having a slightly undervalued currency not a heavily undervalued currency, a slightly mm -hmm. undervalued currency discourages imports because mm -hmm. imports are more expensive than they would be sure. and encourages macroeconomic stability mm -hmm. because India is able to maintain a large foreign currency reserve in right. case of problems. And you mentioned in your opening the large mm -hmm. foreign currency reserves. Yeah. Why are they so big? Mm -hmm. Having such large foreign currency reserves is itself an indication that the rupee is slightly undervalued. Okay, mm -hmm. Countries that have undervalued currencies have big foreign currency reserves. Countries mm -hmm. that have overvalued currencies face attacks by the like of George Soros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when the, okay. when the pound was overvalued, sure. when the Southeast Asian currencies were overvalued, mm -hmm. Soros attacked them mm -hmm. and pricked the bubble. 
Overvalued currencies are generally preferred by the rich. If you want to travel internationally, so rupee is not overvalued or undervalued. To you. Oh, chronically under undervalued. I don't okay. know whether it's over undervalued today. Sure. But chronically, it has mm -hmm. been undervalued, which mm -hmm. encourages manufacturing in India because it makes imports more expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, note that that currency mechanism doesn't pick winners or losers. The reason sure. import substitution doesn't work is that it tends to become corrupt. That is, when the government mm -hmm. picks winners and losers not this current government, I'm not talking about the BJP, I'm saying in general, mm. they inevitably tend to pick their friends. Mm. Right? It, it's simply the instinct to pick people you know. Absolutely. Okay. When you do this through a currency mechanism, when mm. you discourage imports and mm. encourage exports mm. through a currency mechanism, instead what you're doing is generically across the entire economy, mm. let the market decide who's mm. going to export, who's going to import. Let the market decide if, if you need to import a part for your car, instead of having a prohibition on importing steering columns, mm -hmm. the steering columns imported are just that slight bit more expensive than making it here because the currency is undervalued. Mm. And this is what I recommend, and many development economists recommend, having a slightly undervalued currency. Of course, the U.S. hates that. The, the, the U.S. is always pushing other countries to, right. uh, you know, they call it currency manipulation. Mm -hmm. and, but for years, I mean, throughout China's entire development period from 1980 until about 2010, China had a seriously undervalued currency. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it doesn't anymore, but it okay. had a very deeply undervalued currency throughout mm -hmm. that period of rapid growth. And mm -hmm. it's the same mechanism. And most countries that have developed rapidly have taken this approach, whether consciously or unconsciously, right. this approach has been successful. Right. So it, it's, 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 it is quite amazing, the journey, right? Like $566 billion of foreign reserves, which are actually at an 11-month low at the moment from a time when India had to mortgage its gold yeah. to get some money from the IMF so that it could pay off. Well, because India's currency used to be overvalued. So, so if you go so back... So that, that was 30 years ago. It, that was 30, it, it, 40 it, years ago. If, if you go back to that older era, the planning era, sure. India had an overvalued currency, mm -hmm. but if you wanted foreign currency, you had to get a license. <laughs> you, yeah. you had to, yeah. to... And that, of course, is, is a recipe for corruption, to tell mm -hmm. people if you want to travel, you, know, you, have, to, you, you have to get a license Absolutely. to get foreign currency. Having an undervalued currency makes it very easy to manage the currency. Now, even the, even the recent drop mm -hmm. in India's reserves is only when denominated in U.S. dollars. This is something that all the analysts here seem to have missed. Mm -hmm. uh, in recent years, most countries, including India, mm -hmm. have diversified their foreign currency holdings. Mm -hmm. So they're holding more euros Got it. in particular. <laughs> they're also holding yen and other currencies, but mm -hmm. primarily they're holding more euros. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're holding more euros, mm -hmm. but your reserves are denominated in dollars, right. a fall in the value of the euro sure. and a okay. fall in the value, if you're holding more pounds, a fall in the value of the pound mm -hmm. is reflected Mm -hmm. in a reduction in your currency reserves as expressed in dollars. Mm -hmm. So the Reserve Bank has not released statistics on this as mm -hmm. far as I'm aware. Yes. But I'm pretty certain that most of the fall in India's foreign currency reserves is not actually mm -hmm. a drop in literal reserves, that is mm -hmm. the amount of money they have in foreign currency. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's a fall in the value of their euro and pound and yen holdings mm -hmm. because the U.S. dollar has uh, risen against these other currencies. Okay. I so can't verify that. Sure. I would encourage the No, but that's something to, to that has been release. explained to me by another analyst who, who, is, who tracks the Indian economy very closely, right. that India has been diversifying. And uh, that's probably one of the reasons why we see a dip uh, right. in our current uh, foreign reserve ratio. Um, so I want to get your thoughts in on, uh, you know, your outlook on India. What are the sectors that are, uh, you know, exciting <clears> you and uh, that, that could power India's growth uh, in the future? I think it's wrong to think of any particular sector powering growth. Uh, what a country needs to grow is an overall increase in productivity. Mm -hmm. So finding the lowest productivity areas of the economy and increasing productivity in, er in that area. And mm -hmm. in fact, if, if I could you know, just talk to the prime minister and the finance minister for 10 minutes, I would say the best strategy for growth is go through the levels of productivity, labor productivity across mm -hmm. the sectors of the Indian economy, choose the lowest one, and have a big effort to increase productivity in mm -hmm. that area. Now, I suspect the main area right now that is, uh, I haven't done the analysis, but I suspect the lowest productivity area would probably be agriculture. And that's why I keep coming back to agricultural reform, mm -hmm. increasing the productivity of Indian agriculture, shifting from overproduction of rice and wheat. I, I mean, I know they're, they're purchasing quotas uh, for rice and wheat because of the memory of famine. Sure. Well, famine's gone. There, there's ne right. there will, I'll state this categorically, there will never again be a famine in mm. India. So why produce immense stockpiles of rice and wheat 
mm. that then simply rot in the warehouse, or more likely these days, rot outside the warehouse because right. there isn't even room in the warehouse right. for it. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, Indian agriculture should be shifting over to higher value products, mm -hmm. for instance, edible oils. Okay, India is a major importer of edi edible, edible oils, oils. Yes. Uh, and cooking oils from the rest of the world. Well, mm -hmm. why aren't those produced in India? They could be produced in India, but Indian farmers are being incentivized instead mm -hmm. to produce wheat and rice to go, <laughs> to go into stockpiles sure. instead of switching over to higher value added mm -hmm. edible oils. So this mm -hmm. kind of transition, liberalization of the agricultural sector mm -hmm. would both increase productivity of the Indian economy as a whole mm -hmm. and also reduce the import bill Mm -hmm. by taking products that are currently imported at high prices mm -hmm. and make them in India uh, at low prices. Okay, so even as we speak today, and you know, you were mentioning about our food grains rotting in, uh, in you know, our warehouses, which is true. Uh, last week I had a discussion on Pakistan's economy where it's become a very common sight to see people queuing up yeah. to get access to basic food supplies. And uh, they're, they're looking for a bailout from the IMF. We know that Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan economy too defaulted and it's, it's gone through a huge downturn and still, it's still struggling for survival. What makes India an island amidst our neighbors? You know, what's, what's, what's working for India? How is it that Amongst all our neighbors, India is the only country where we're talking about surplus food. Malnutrition was a problem at one sure. point. India, though India keeps, c continues to get featured in the hunger index, which I do not understand how, because we do have surplus food right now. We have foreign reserves, which, which, you know, which, which make us feel very comfortable. So what, what has worked in India's favor, according to you? Look, there are highly technical problems with the Global Hunger Index, and, and the fundamental problem is not the numbers, it's that they've been turned into a ranking mm -hmm. when really they shouldn't be, and that, that's a long story, but mm -hmm. there are technical issues behind that. More broadly, India's institutions mm -hmm. are stronger than in the rest of the region. Mm -hmm. I mean, I keep telling people, India is the only well-institutionalized democracy mm -hmm. in Eurasia between South Korea on one end and Israel on the other. Some people say, the, they, and almost the only democracy in the region, or, or democracy that has at least two or three decades of mm -hmm. free and fair elections. And it's that same, well, it's that same level of quality institutions in India mm -hmm. that is responsible for ensuring that Indians have proper food distribution, for mm -hmm. ensuring that Indians, well, we, we've seen the, even the, uh, the toilets program mm -hmm. from a few years yes, ago. Yes, know, being pilot, able to yeah. roll these out, it's, it's a capacity issue. And India has the capacity because it's developed these strong mm -hmm. institutions. And these institutions all go back, mm -hmm. fundamentally, they go back to democracy. Mm -hmm. Not because democracy leads to these institutions, but because having strong institutions leads to a quality democracy in the same way it leads to the ability to deliver services mm -hmm. across the country. Mm -hmm. And those institutions have been developed in India from right from the beginning of the Republic uh, by a strong sense among Indians mm -hmm. from that first generation that India should develop institutions, not personalities. That mm. what the future they wanted for India mm -hmm. was one of strong institutions and they developed strong institutions. Mm -hmm. In many cases, India's independence leaders were willing to put aside their personal ambitions mm -hmm. in order to ensure that the country was institutionally strong. Now sure. India is reaping the benefits of these strong institutions. Interesting. But fascinating that you do bring up this point about <clears throat> Indian people and uh, the Indian polity uh, of, of the earlier India wanted to build strong institutions and not personalities. Do we see that changing now? Because uh, in the UPA, we, we saw the rise of the Gandhis and everything is, was centered around the Gandhis and politics in India are centered around personalities. We see the current government, yeah. it's called the Modi-led government. So do we see that changing now? I, I, I don't think so. Actually, I see it being reinforced now. Okay. So first I should be clear, when I say strong institutions, I mean strong institutions for a country of India's GDP per capita. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you whether India's institutions are stronger than European Union institutions. That would be an unfair comparison. Sure. Compared to Bangladeshi institu in, institutions or you know, Pakistani institutions mm -hmm. or even, remember, India's GDP per capita is roughly equivalent to that of Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, institutions in India are incredibly stronger 
sure. in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's why I expect so much growth mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. Now, when people say that politics have become personalized, that it's all about Mr. Modi, that it's mm -hmm. you know, presidential politics, I say, no, no, that, that, that's the branding. Okay. That's the branding. Mm -hmm. But if you look at how Modi wins elections, how the BJP wins elections, it wins elections through extensive organization all across India. So I've, mm -hmm. I've recently read two books on the 2019 election, mm -hmm. as, uh, as opposing as they could be. Rajdeep Sardesai's book mm -hmm. on 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, Rajdeep Sardesai, of course, is a you know, liberal journalist. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anurban Ganguly's mm -hmm. book on the 2019 yeah. election. And he yeah. is uh, you know, at the SP Mukherjee Foundation, mm -hmm. and he's a BJP intellectual. Yes. They have very different uh, understandings mm -hmm. of what, how, what they should take away from the election. But they tell the same exact story, that the mm -hmm. BJP modernized mm -hmm. its party to become an, a highly organized machine with a presence, pan-Indian presence, which uses information technology tools, mm -hmm. which uses uh, you know, WhatsApp groups and such to get out the vote, that has a very strong organizational basis. Right. So if you ask me, why did the BJP win? Mm -hmm. I said, no, no, it's not because people love Narendra Modi. Yes, mm -hmm. people love Narendra Modi. That's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't mean they'll vote for him. Mm -hmm. The BJP won that election mm -hmm. because of their extraordinary organizational effort. They built a strong organization. That's right. It's about the institutional development. Mm -hmm. And what the opposition parties need yeah. in India to counter that mm -hmm. is they also have to professionalize mm -hmm. their institutions. They have to become mm -hmm. modern organizational bureaucracies in, a way, in the way that the BJP is. Mm -hmm. So although there's this branding, um, that's really no different from in other countries. I mean, in the UK, you know, it's the prime minister who goes to the election. In, in, in Australia, you're, you're voting primarily for the prime ministerial candidate, sure. not for the... Uh, in the US, you're voting for the presidential candidate. You may not even know who your local member of Congress is. Mm -hmm. But US politics are not dominated by these personalities. US mm -hmm. politics work because both major political parties mm -hmm. have very strong organizational bases at the sure. county level mm -hmm. in every county mm -hmm. in the Absolutely. United States. Mm -hmm. for, so Indian politics, no, have not become more driven by personalities. Mm -hmm. If anything, they've modernized to become less driven by the person. The fact that you put the poster up with a face on it mm. doesn't mean that that's what wins you the election. Getting people to the polls to vote for you Absolutely. is what wins the election. Okay, that's fascinating. I also want to ask you about uh, you know, India's position right now to take advantage of the China Plus strategy that's playing out sure. across the world. What does it, what, where does India need to be? What does India need to do right now to get those businesses to come and look at India uh, uh, in a very positive way? And really, we've, we've see, we've see, a start has been made, right. but to ensure that we really ride this wave. Look, one major disadvantage is poor port development in India, and we've mm -hmm. seen in, uh, in Tiruvananthapuram the problems with the Adani port being held up, and you know, India's export capacity probably isn't large enough for mm -hmm. it to transform itself into a major export economy. Mm -hmm. That said, India does not have to become a major export economy. There's this mm -hmm. misunderstanding that because of the Asian tigers, Sure. Everyone now thinks that growth can only be accomplished through exports. Mm. So India has about 20%, a little over 20% of GDP is accounted for by exports. Mm. And you can compare that to Mexico. Mexico's at 40% of GDP. Or mm -hmm. China is probably, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, probably around 40% of GDP. And you think, oh, to grow, India has to become like them. Mm -hmm. But then I point out the counterexamples. Um, Brazil and Argentina are both around. You have Brazil 8,000, Argentina $10,000 GDP mm -hmm. per capita. They have 20%. GDP, uh, exports as a percentage of GDP. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look across the world, mm -hmm. there's virtually no correlation between exports as a percent of GDP and either okay. GDP per capita mm -hmm. or GDP per capita okay. growth. It mm -hmm. just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Exports are one way to growth. Okay. Ref internal reform is another path mm -hmm. to growth. So what, what Argentina and Brazil have are incredibly productive agricultural sectors. Mm -hmm. Agricultural productivity in those countries is on a par with the United States. Mm -hmm. okay, they're highly mechanized, highly efficient mm -hmm. agricultural sectors. Mm -hmm. What you have to do to grow is have high levels of productivity. Now, the East Asian strategy mm -hmm. for that was to open the export sector mm -hmm. so that the high productivity sector in mm -hmm. Taiwan, South Korea, and China, the sure. high productivity sector is the export sector, mm -hmm. and the domestic sector is relatively low productivity mm -hmm. and operates as a drag on the economy. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, in countries like Argentina and Brazil, 
It's the agricultural sector that's the most high productivity sector in the economy. Mm. And it's the export sector that's actually a drag <laughs> on the economy. Right. So the key is to have high productivity industries. Mm. It doesn't really matter where in the economy those are, whether that's the agricultural sector, the export sector, the services sector, wherever it is, as long as it becomes more productive, mm -hmm. you'll have economic growth. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, we wish you the very best for your book. Looking forward uh, to reading it. Uh, Professor Baboons is writing a book on Indian democracy and he's here as part of his research, I'm assuming. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. It was Thank a pleasure you. talking to you.